Are you ready? Lagos, are you ready? I am ready. With God's hands lifted up and all hallelujah joy, let us welcome our Father, our mentor, our pastor, Dr. Emil Yamina. Somebody shout glory. Whoa. Amen. Are you excited tonight? What a blessing to be in Lagos finally tonight. Glory to God. Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, we rejoice that we are found in you. Thank you for this. Another opportunity to fellowship in the light of your word. We walk in the light, even as you are in the light. And we rejoice that tonight your word comes with clarity. This weekend is a weekend that is set apart to cause men to walk in the light of your world. So we decree that burdens and yokes are destroyed. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. We decree that your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Our hearts are filled with joy, unspeakable, full of glory. And we thank you for grace that abounds in this place. And we give you praise that by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Amen. What a joy to see everybody. Whoa. Amen. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self tonight. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to quickly begin tonight by acknowledging all of our pastors and campus coordinators in the Lagos area. And what a joy to see all of you and to have shared fellowship with some of you since we came. I want to appreciate all the people who have been around us making sure we settled in properly. You know, since morning, some of you have been on your, on your feet since morning just making sure we're comfortable. Thank you again for your sacrifices. Thank you for your love and thank you for making us comfortable. I want to quickly acknowledge Pastor Gospel Johnson who coordinates our Ogba campus. Pastor Gospel, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for Christ. And thank you for what you do for us in West Africa. He coordinates our West African operation. Bless you again and good to have you here tonight. All right, the host pastor, Pastors Funke and Pastor Jones. We love you and thank you. Let's celebrate them and honor them. Thank you for your labor. Thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for everything you've done to make sure that we continue to advance the cause of Christ continue to promote God's purpose upon the face of the earth. Also, we have Pastor Uma, who pastors our Ikorodu campus. So good to have you, Pastor Uma. Bless you. Good to see you, and thank you for what you do for the brethren and for the kingdom of God there in Ikorodu. Pastor Rose is also here at the VI campus. Pastor Rose, bless you. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you. Thank you for all you do for the kingdom. Thank you for all you do for the brethren. You, you're doing it for Jesus himself. Pastor Abasiono is also here, Surilere Campus. Pastor Abasiono, we love you. Thank you for what you do, you know, for Power City and for the brethren there at Surilere Campus. Pastor Funsho is also here from Oshodi Campus. Love you, Pastor Funsho. We thank God for you. And once again, happy birthday. Today is his birthday. Amen. Bless you, man. We love you and we honor what you do for Christ. And then our global campus coordinator is here with me. And that is the man who brought me to the pulpit this night. Pastor Matthew, where is he? 
Pastor Matt, we love you, man. We love you, man. Thank you for all you do for Power City. We honor you and celebrate you and thank God for you. Praise God. Pastor Frank showed up. I don't know how he got here from Port Harcourt Campus. Let's celebrate Pastor Frank from Port Harcourt Campus. Love you, Pastor Frank. Thank you for what you do for our brethren there in Port Harcourt and uh, in that part of the world. Also, Pastor Shea is here. Pastor Shea is here. He's, he's with us tonight. Pastor Shea, God bless you. We love you. Thank you for what you do. Your church again is where? Surulere. Yeah, that's where his church is. Thank you for preaching Christ and standing with Christ. We love and appreciate you. Welcome again tonight. Can we celebrate him? Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. All right, and everybody is here tonight. Thank you all for standing with the vision. Let's celebrate ourselves in the building. Glory. Amen. All right, are you ready for the word of God? Let's get into it. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. We are going to be examining knowing God beyond superstition. Knowing God beyond superstition. Brother Paul says to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is faith in Christ Jesus. Salvation, which is the subject of the scriptures, because Paul is telling Timothy, you've known the holy scriptures. And of course, the holy scriptures will be Genesis to Malachi, which are able to make thee wise. The word Euda, E-I-D-O in the Greek, it means it's able to make you wise, skillful. That the scriptures are able to make you skillful unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So brother Paul is talking to Timothy about the scriptures. So the word known is the word Euda in the Greek. It connotes to perceive or to be acquainted with. You have known Euda, E-I-D-O in the Greek, which means to perceive or to be acquainted with. Euda is spelled as E-I-D-O. All right, and it means to be to perceive or to be acquainted with. Then there's another word here. You've known the holy scriptures, which are able. The word able is translated from the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis. It implies to be possible or to be of power. You've known the holy scriptures, which are able, which are of power. All right, to make you wise. The word wise is the word sophizo. S o P H I Z O. Sophizo is taken from the word Sophia. It means he's able to make you wise. He's able to make you skillful unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Observe that the word, the knowledge of the scriptures imparts wisdom. So when you come to the knowledge of the scriptures, it will impart into you wisdom. And that wisdom will be in the subject of salvation. Or wisdom in the salvation Jesus provides. Which means that there's well, a child of God requires a skillfulness. The knowledge and acquaintance of with the scripture will impart fear. When you spend quality time to learn the scriptures, to study the scriptures, to be taught the scriptures, eventually it will bring you to a place of skillfulness. That's why Timothy was skillful. He was able to appreciate and appropriate the scriptures. He was able to use the scriptures the correct and the proper way. Because he had developed skillfulness by his acquaintance and appreciation of the scriptures that's very important then verse 16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable the word ophilimos it means useful or advantageous profitable useful or advantageous now brother paul goes further to expatiate how the word doctrine was translated from the greek the word didascalia. The scriptures are able to make you profit or are able to deliver profit to you in the areas of doctrine. The word doctrine is the word didascalia. 
it means teaching or explanation so the scriptures will not be useful to you until they are taught and until they are explained teaching or explanation so the profitability of the scripture will come to the believer through teaching that word teaching is the same word for learning learning through teaching so it is via teaching that the believer gets knowledge via teaching the scriptures are profitable for teaching learning so in teaching the believer will acquire knowledge it's a function of teaching that the script the believer engages in that will eventually bring that believer to a place of reproof now when it says reproof correction instruction doctrine reproof correction instruction they are not four things it is one thing which is learning which is teaching along with teaching will come reproof along with teaching will come correction along with teaching will come instruction in righteousness which is actually spiritual growth so that means you cannot grow spiritually it doesn't matter how long you've been in the church you can be in a church for 40 years of your life and you're just a, a, a you know an infant wearing pampas there's no growth whatsoever until you are taught exposure to the teaching of god's word is what brings you to a place of maturity and growth somebody can be in the kingdom of god for only three months but has grown more than somebody that has been in the church for 40 years because it is exposure to teaching that produces spiritual growth can somebody shout hallelujah so it's profitable for teaching for explanation and through that the believer will come to a place of spiritual growth training in righteousness now please it's important for you to know that the scriptures are the source of any evidence and training the scriptures are the source of any evidence and training we cannot train you outside the scriptures any training that is devoid of the scriptures is fraudulent so the scriptures therefore is the boundary of all spiritual growth and training your knowledge of god therefore must be situated within the rightly divided word of truth i repeat your knowledge of god must be situated within the confines of the rightly divided word of truth any knowledge of god you have that cannot be substituted or cannot be substantiated with the rightly divided word of truth you are in deception or idol worship any knowledge of god that cannot be substantiated with the rightly divided word of truth you will find yourself in idol worship or you will find yourself worshiping a god that only exists in your mind a god that doesn't exist anywhere else only exists in your mind and many people in the church world are actually in the worship of a god that only exists in their minds a god that is subject to their experiences a God that is subject to their exposure. A God that is subject to their domain, their realm. That God does not exist elsewhere. Only in their minds. And that God can disappoint. That God can fail. That God can mess them up. And that's why when some people have tried to function with that God that exists in their mind. And it begins to fail them. They conclude that something must be wrong with God. And they're going to atheism the atheists are people that have tried god that was not well explained to them and they got disappointed and in disappointment they walked away and said that there is no god anywhere and the reason is because their their knowledge of god is not situated within the rightly divided word of truth their knowledge of god cannot be substantiated with the god of the bible because there is the god of the bible and there is the god of religion am i teaching there's a god of the bible and there's a god of religion that is why when we bring the teaching from the word of god that unveils the god of the bible the god of religion fights the god of the bible because religion is make-believe religion has created its own god religion creates its own god but the father of our lord jesus christ created us see that but religion creates its own god and when religion creates its own god it carves out its own expectation of this god it has created 
And if that God fails, fails below that expectation, they conclude something must be wrong with God. But there's nothing wrong with God. It's just that many people don't really know God. You see, the very core of Christian worship is Bible interpretation. Let me repeat. The very core of Christian worship is Bible interpretation. The very core of Christian worship is Bible interpretation. So, if your interpretation of the scriptures are wrong, your worship cannot be right. If your interpretation of the scriptures are wrong, your worship cannot be right. So, that means, therefore, to truly worship God right, you must know God in the rightly divided word of truth. Very important. Very fundamental. Very, very fundamental. Your opinion of God must go beyond superstition. It must go beyond hearsay. Your opinion of God must go beyond what you think. It must go beyond what you expect. Your opinion of God must be derived from the confines of the Holy Scriptures. Rightly divided. There's a reason why I am adding rightly divided. I'm not just stopping at the Scriptures. Don't just know God within the scriptures. That is the God that religion communicates. You must know God within the rightly divided word of truth. Paul said to Timothy, You study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. So if there's a right way to divide the scriptures, it means there's a wrong way to divide it. When the scriptures are wrongly divided, they arrive at a God that is not a God of the Bible. And that is where religion comes with the, with, with, with the saying, he kill it and make it alive. God kill it and make it alive. And they will show you in the Bible. God can change his mind. And they will show you in the Bible. And God repented. Yeah? Say, yeah, God can destroy. They will show in the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah. God is good, but sometimes he can be bad. They show in the Bible, Job said, do we expect only good from God and not bad? So the God that religion communicates is a bipolar God. A God that is extreme good, extreme bad. And you don't know which side can come on you at any time. So you have to be careful. And all of us grew up in religious homes. Most of us, if not all of us, where we were taught to fear God. Fear God. Fear God. And along with that fear of God came many fears. Many fears. So our minds got messed up with the religious God that you cannot reconcile with the God of the Bible rightly divided. Now please don't, don't miss that. Your knowledge of God must be situated within the rightly divided word of truth. And I'm going to do some work on that in the next few days. Now, <clears throat> most of the time, you know, an ignorant daddy raised us up. Who learned from his ignorant daddy about God? I'm teaching good. So, because your daddy was always reading Bible and always praying fear prayers, you believe that he was a man of God. When you want to travel, you tell you, kneel down, kneel down, kneel down. You can't go out till we pray. And the prayer is fear filled. Every night you see your father praying and shaking and crying. You say, this man is close to God. Because in your religious mind, once there is cry. It means the man is close to God. Religion is wicked. But thank God for revelation. Thank God for revelation. Somebody shout, I receive revelation knowledge. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Now so, religion gives that kind of idea of a God that only exists within the figment of a man's imagination. Just like the conscience. You hear somebody say, I'm trying to do it, but my conscience will not allow me. My conscience will not let me. And you forget that your conscience is your making. Your conscience is a byproduct of the knowledge you have acquired. It is the knowledge available to you that forms your conscience. 
Your conscience is not the voice of God. Your conscience is not the leading of the spirit. Your conscience is a product of the knowledge you have acquired. And I'm sure we'll examine that tomorrow or on Sunday. Now, so let's look at something else tonight. Glory to God. Now, remember, Job chapter 42 verse number 5. Let me just put that out first before we begin to explore that. Job 42 verse number five <clears throat> and i want everybody to read with me like a mass choir job chapter 42 verse number five hallelujah can we all go together everybody like a mass choir want to go i have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear but now my eye seeth thee job 42 now, in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, before we go further with Job, Jesus rose from the dead and he met his own disciples on the way to Emmaus, arguably Cleopas and his wife. And there was a conversation about his death and about his own resurrection. And his own disciples made it appear like Jesus died the death of a Mattia, a good guy that died for a just cause, a good guy that was innocent, that was so good, but they just killed him for nothing. So they made it appear like he was killed for what he believed or what he did. In that Luke chapter 24, put up for me on the screen, Luke 24 from verse 19 to 21. I'd like you to follow the discourse in the reading. Luke chapter 24 from verse 19 to verse 21. Luke 24. And he said unto them, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Next verse. Next verse. Verse 20. <clears throat> and now the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. 21. Verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel and beside all these. Today is the third day since these things were done. Next verse. I like the next verse. Verse 22. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were earlier the sepulchre. Next verse. Verse 23. Mm -mm. Verse 20. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. Verse 24. Hmm. Glory to God. And certain of them which were with which, which were with us, went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. We thought this guy was coming to free us from the tyranny of Caesar. We thought this guy was going to restore to us political relevance and political importance, especially in this year of election 2023. We thought he was going to give us political relevance and political value. And now they said, they, they, they not only killed him, the woman that went to check him out said the body is disappeared. No hope for us. And they were talking to Jesus about Jesus. So he turned to them and he said to them, Oh fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Next verse, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Verse 27 of Luke 24. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He said to them, guys, when you read the Torah, when you read the Old Testament, if you were paying attention, you should have known that my death is not my tiredom, that my death was spoken of, that the reason why I came was to die. I didn't come to restore political relevance. My kingdom is not of this world. I came to die so that man can be restored into fellowship with God. Jesus is God Almighty who became a man took the place of man in death that he could reconcile man with God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Beginning at Moses, in all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets, Old Testament prophets, Old Testament prophets, prophets of the scriptures. If you had been paying attention, you should have known that this is why I came to suffer and to enter into my glory. 
And then later on, he met some of those guys, you know, who were not there when he met these other two guys. In verse 44, and he said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled. I came to fulfill these things. That means all these things were spoken about me. That means I'm the reason for Isaiah. I'm the reason for Jeremiah. I'm the reason for Ezekiel. Without me, there will be no Ezekiel. Without me, there will be no Moses. I am not one of them. I'm the reason why they existed. And everything they lived their lives speaking was to point you to me. Now I have come to fulfill what Moses and Isaiah and all the prophets have spoken. The, the book of Moses, the Psalms, the prophets concerning me can somebody shout hallelujah now look at the importance of what he did after expounding and opening the scriptures and making the scriptures come al alive to them by teaching them from moses genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy then he entered the prophets major prophets minor prophets of the old testament after opening himself every book he brought himself out every book he brought himself out when they saw how he tied the entire message as himself verse 45 said then open he their understanding so bible study is useless until you see christ i am an again. it is christ that unveils the scriptures am i talking to somebody here you know you lagos people are beginning to make me feel too happy tonight i thought it's too early to be feeling too happy now glory then open he their understanding. That word understanding here is not the same with this word understand. Now, you must never forget. The Bible is not English. The Bible has its own language. The Bible has its own language. So, when you see a word in the Bible, don't go to English dictionary. Don't go to Oxford dictionary. Don't go to Macmillan dictionary. When you see a word in the Bible, don't go to, you'll be messed up. You will end up where the religious leaders are. You will end up with them. The word understanding is the word dinogio in the Greek. Dinogio. D-I-A-G-O-N-E-O. -E dinogio. Open he, they are dinogio. That they might tsunami. The second understand is the word tsunami. S-U-N-E-M-I. Alright. Then open he via dinogio. That they might tsunami the scriptures. So understanding dinogio. Understand tsunami. You know, I was flipping through social media about three, four years ago or five years ago, sometime back. And then somebody copied my message, my video, and put on his page. And wrote on top of the video, this is the good. I got angry. I got angry. I'm a sheep and you're calling me goat? I'm the sheep of his pasture. How can you be calling me this is the good? Me good? Because I have never heard the word good. So it, it, what is good? How can I be good when I am sheep? In what way am I a good? I started asking myself. I said, this is one of the attackers of my message. So upon all the labor of my teaching, you cannot, in fact, you should have not even said anything. You call me goat. Then I went to mama. I said, honey, I'm not happy today. She said, why? I said, somebody just copied my teaching. Very powerful teaching. I wrote on top. This is the goat. So she said to me, is that why you're angry? I said, yes. She said, Bushman. So I said to her, what do you mean by Bushman? You too, you believe I'm a goat? 
She said, goat doesn't mean meh. <laughs> He said, God doesn't mean meh. She said, it's a short form of saying, this is the greatest of all time. G-O-A-T. So I went back to the page and I liked it. <laughs> now I'm a good. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody? So when you read the Bible, you must not see goat and think man. <laughs> because goat is not man. When I saw that, I said, whoa. So this guy believes I'm the greatest of all time. I liked it. I took note of his name. Watch him for more videos he will post. Can you see how a simple meaning of a word can change everything? That's the way it is with Bible study. If you miss the interpretation of scripture, your worship cannot be right. You will be worshiping the unknown God. Jesus said to the woman in John chapter 4, you worship, you know not what. When you worship and you don't know what you are worshiping, you are in idol worship. He said, but we know what we worship. For salvation is from the Jews. You know not what you worship. Then he said, you shall neither in this mountain. Because if you don't know what you're worshiping, you'll be going to a mountain. If you don't know what you're worshiping, you'll be going to Jerusalem every year to bring holy water. Gallons of holy water. Gallons of olive oil. Sand from Israel. Sand. Religion is wicked. You go to the wailing wall and wail with your prayer requests. You will even go to the grave of Jesus. The so-called grave. The so-called grave. A man of God said to me in this country, one of the respected pastors, he said to me, Dr. Domina, a few years ago I was in Israel and I went to the grave of Jesus. As soon as I entered the grave, God spoke to me. He said, my son, for coming here today, anywhere you go from now, preach about your experience. And when you preach it, my healing power will flow. When he said it, I didn't know when I said, eh? Eh? I didn't know when I said, eh? Even when Jesus rose from the dead and the people came to the grave to look for Jesus, they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He's no longer here. I have news for you. He's no longer there. He's here now. Oh, you didn't see what I said. He's no longer there. He's here now. So if you want to see the resurrected Jesus, come to me. Come close, come close, come close. I carry the resurrected Christ. Somebody shout. It's no longer in the grave. He's alive. And he lives in our hearts. I thought somebody would shout glory. He's alive. So the word understanding and the word understand are not the same. Dinogio, it means he split open their mind for the first time. Dinogio, it's like the baby that opens the womb of the mother. The first opening of the womb. That means all these years, these guys have been reading Genesis to, to Malachi. They have never understood nothing. All these years, they read and read and didn't understand anything until Jesus beginning at Moses and all the prophets and David the Psalms, when he opened it and showed them that this is me, these books are talking about, for the first time, their understanding split off open, and then he said, the tsunami. Tsunami means the split, the split of their understanding to be open was as a result of putting the facts together. Tsunami means when the facts were collected together. What facts? The facts that he is the message of the scriptures. Their understanding opened up. And in John 1 45, Philip found Nathaniel and said to Nathaniel, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. I'm not telling a Lagos hallelujah. Now they have been reading. Possibly they have been quoting, even preaching from it. But for the very first time, 
Their mind understood the message. The first time. Their minds opened to the message. Jesus opened their thinking that they may understand. That they may understand. Which means for the very first time, they saw the whole book as a singular revelation. The whole Bible is a singular revelation. The whole Bible is a singular message. We don't have messages. We have a message. We don't have messages. I have said it times to that number. When two preachers are preaching from the same verse of scripture and their destination is different, either both of them are lying or one of them is lying. The scriptures don't have dual meaning. It's an insult to think that the scriptures mean different things. It's like saying I stood before you and then I said to you, I have made up my mind from now. From now, I have made up my mind. I'm going to move from a quay bomb and live in Lekki. Wait, wait now. Wait. Now, when I say that to you, it will be an insult on my sensibilities for somebody to come and say, what he actually means is that he will be visiting Lagos while still living in a quiet. What you are saying is that I am not together. What you are saying is that I don't know what I am talking about. Or what you are saying is that I don't mean what I am saying. I am a joker. Otherwise, you will not be deducing a different meaning from what I communicated. God is not the author of confusion. He cannot say one thing and have diverse meaning to it. There's only a singular revelation of the scriptures. The entire Bible hinges on a message. One revelation. One context. One content. One message. We don't have messages. We have a message. And until that message is communicated, men remain in darkness. That message brings light, revelation, and understanding. That's why Peter will say, no interpretation of the scripture is of any private, no, no scripture is of any private interpretation. The word interpretation is the word origin. Is the word source. Is the word inspiration. No scripture in the Bible has a different origin or source or inspiration. Which means the Bible has a singular origin. The Bible has a singular source. The Bible has a singular inspiration. Then brother Peter now said, For the prophecy. For the prophecy. Not for the prophecies. Second Peter 1 20, so we can see it together. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. Glory to God. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. Glory to God. Are we enjoying tonight? Yeah, I'm enjoying myself. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. It's coming, it's coming. Just come close, it's coming. Glory to God. Second Peter chapter 1. It looks like we need to check it in our Bible. Second Peter, that's why you have your Bible. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 20. <clears throat> Brother Peter, now speaking in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private source, origin, or inspiration. For the prophecy, the prophecy, singular. For the prophecy, verse 21 now. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved. So the source of their speaking was the Holy Ghost. One source, one inspiration, one origin. And because it is one, he called it the prophecy. Not prophecies. 
So the Bible is one prophecy. It's not prophecies. For the prophecy, this is Peter, a profound apostle, an apostle of the Lamb. This is Peter speaking. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. What Peter was saying is not saying that we cannot prophesy by our will. But he's saying the prophecy of scripture didn't come from the will of a man. Men were moved by the Holy Ghost. But you know today we prophesy by our will. I will pray in the spirit. I will pray with my understanding. If I pray in tongues and I interpret, what is that? Prophecy. So by my will, I prophesy today. But in the communication of the scriptures, it was not from the origin or the will of a man. It was from the same source. All of them prophets prophesied. Because it's a singular message. Singular interpretation. Singular origin. That's what makes the scriptures profound. Because these are men that never met each other. Some of them met, never met each other for 1,000 years. And when their books were collated together, it was one message. That's what makes the scriptures infallible. That, is, that, that, was, the, that was the requirement for the canonization of the scriptures. No scripture was permitted to be canonized that was not tied with what, this one message. The entire 66 books... It's one message. One. One. Anything outside this one message is fraud. Somebody is wasting your time. Deceiving you and cajoling you. In the name of deaths. Portals and realms. High sounding nonsense. Dimensions. There's no other dimension that is deeper than in Christ. Where is the believer? In Nothing can be deeper. Nothing can be higher. Nothing can be wider. Nothing can be stronger than in Christ. That's where you are. Therefore, if any man be where in. Somebody shout, I'm complete in him. I didn't hear a powerful amen. See now, let's push it a little more. All right, now. That means... When Jesus took time to teach them, he corrected their thinking. You correct people's thinking by intensive and exhaustive Bible teaching. There's no other way to correct a man's perception, a man's thought pattern, a man's mindset outside sound, intensive Bible teaching. Beginning at Moses, that's some serious Bible study. He corrected their thinking. So for the first time, their thinking was now in line with the scriptures. Their thinking was now in line with the scriptures. It's possible to be quoting the scriptures. It's possible to even know memory verses. But your thinking is wrong. For example, when I was growing up as a young boy, I was taught John, I mean Romans chapter 3 verse 23, which many of you can quote now if I just say, let's quote it. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Isn't that easy? For all have seen. So, as a young boy growing, I began to say, but this is not fair. Adam seen and all have seen. It doesn't look just. All have seen and come short of the glory of God. So that means every human being is born a sinner. And I felt like God was unjust. What about a baby that has not done anything? How can that baby be a sinner? But I couldn't find answers because I was also told don't ask questions. God can smite you sharp, sharp. The other side of God. God has two sides. I was also told the secret things belong to God. But the ones that are revealed are for us and our children. I was also told that God's ways are mysterious. His wonders to perform. So I had a lot of questions in my mind about this God that affected my relationship with God. 
that sometimes I pray, I'm not sure of God because of my mindset. The things I was taught. So when I pray, I'm not sure God answers. I have to look for one powerful man of God. I know some of you grew in very revelation knowledge houses. Some of us. <laughs> religion almost killed us. It's small God's mercy that kept us alive to be free. We were taught all these kind of things. And we believed that that's what it was. But as I grew and I began to study the scriptures and I began to check God's character in the light of the rightly divided world, I discovered Romans 3.23 is not talking about God. It's talking about Moses. Under the law of Moses, the law has condemned everybody. So by the law, all have sinned. You are not a sinner by birth. You were not born a sinner. I had not known sin until the law said. So it is the law that has condemned everybody under sin. Which means everybody is not born a sinner. Your baby that is born today is not a sinner. Your child is not a sinner. None of us was born a sinner. We were all born innocent. I'm pausing so you can think. Seller. None of us was born a sinner. We were all born innocent. Just like Adam was created innocent. Adam was neither mortal nor immortal. Awaiting his choice. It was his choice that determined the outcome of where he belonged. That's the same way everybody is born. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 5 verse number 12. Please pay attention. Romans 5 12. Glory to God. Wherefore, as by one man, Pay attention. Sin entered the word esokomai. It means a foreign object that did not exist has been introduced. Sin entered into the world and death by sin. Pay attention. And so death passed. Death did what? Passed. In English when we say pass, what does it mean? It means it was traveling. So death was traveling from one house to another. From one house to another. Depending on what the house decides to choose. You are not automatically a sinner until you make the choice. And until you are the age of choice making, you are not a sinner. I don't know if I'm teaching good. You are not a sinner by birth. You are a sinner by choice. You are born innocent. That's why I use the word past upon all men for that all have sinned all right now pay attention to the next verse verse 13 for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed the greek word logizomai sin is not imputed or is not accounted where there is no law next verse you will like verse 14 nevertheless that reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not seen. So under the reign of death from Adam to Moses, there were people that did not sin. Why didn't they sin? Was it because they were born different? No. Choice. If the sin of Adam is automatic, the first inheritor will be Abel and Cain, the children of Adam. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 4. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. By faith Abel 
offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Adam, sinner. Eve, sinner. Abel in the house of Adam, righteous. Choice. The choice came before Abel. Abel said, I have faith in the lamb that will be slain. The choice came to Cain. Cain said, I don't believe. Bible says it was of the evil one. Abel righteous, Cain sinner in the same house. Under sinner father, sinner mother. But the boy is righteous in that house. Oh, I'm teaching good here. Paul said, I was, I was, I was innocent once. Then sin came and it revived me. So the question is, when was he innocent? When he was a child. When did sin come alive? When he came to the age of accountability. Age of accountability is where you make choice. It's where you make choice. Somebody say, but as a little boy, I was always guilty. Because that is what you were exposed to. Not because you were a sinner, but information was given to you that kept you under condemnation. Especially families where every day you repent. Every day you confess. When you finish confessing, you must add on top. Both the ones I have committed and the ones I have not committed. So there's a lot of sin consciousness. But I have news for you. There is therefore now. No condemnation to those who are where. Where are you right now? In Christ. No condemnation. No crima, no catacrima, no crisis. No guilt. No condemnation. Glory to God. Lift your right hand and shout, I am as righteous as Jesus. Now, please be careful because religion can't take that. So as you're about to say it, make sure the people sitting beside you are righteous. people. So nobody throws a mosaic stone on you. <laughs> say it very loud, I am as righteous as Jesus. I didn't hear a powerful amen. So me, I'm not a sinner. I am blameless. I am accepted. When I stand before God, the only thing he sees is righteous, righteous, righteous. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Preaching good tonight. Stay with me. Let's push a little more. So, which means, therefore, if your thinking is wrong, your revelation of God cannot be right. So, Jesus opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So, for the first time, they could relate with the books of the Bible in harmony. They could look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they could see that the factor that ties them together is Christ. Genesis, Christ. Where is Christ in Genesis? Light be, light was. Genesis 1-3. Where is Christ in Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Immortality, immortality. Incorruption, incorruption. God in a man. The intent of God. The intent of God is that God and man will live together. Genesis is God's intent. Then in Exodus, he now says, build a tabernacle that I may dwell among you. So Exodus is the expression of the intent in Genesis. Am I teaching good? So Moses wants to say Christ. He can't say Christ because he doesn't have the verbiage. So he says heaven and earth. Then he says darkness. Then he says, and God said, light be. Christ be, me be. John, John now took it and said, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light. Light be, God be, Christ be. 
So Genesis 1, 1, God's intent to live in a man. Genesis 2, problem, darkness everywhere. Genesis 1, 3, God's solution, light. And that word which became light, which became life, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And of his fullness have we all received grace and for grace. I thought somebody would shout glory. I'm teaching good tonight. That's God's intent. To live in a man. To tabernacle in a man. And today, Paul will say, what? Know ye not? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You are God's tabernacle. You are the tabernacle. God has no house anywhere else. You are the house of God. And he will live in you forever. Oh, I feel like I'm teaching good tonight. He says, I will never leave nor forsake you. I will live in you. I will walk in you. I will be your God. You will be my sons and my daughters. Then John will say, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of you didn't hear that. Coming down out of, out of, out of, out. If you're understanding, shout I hear. A new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. And that new heaven and the new earth is a born again man. The man in Christ. God is not building. God is not creating. He has finished. And you are the product that God spent all this time working on. God can never create anything better than you. You are the best of God. He calls you the last Adam. There is first Adam. There is second Adam. There is last. Not third. Last. Because no other Adam can ever be created that is better than this one. You, God exhausted all of his creativity when he was creating the new man. We are his workmanship. Created where? In Christ Jesus. Unto what? Good works. Which God before ordained that we should walk in there. Glory to God. Now, now sit, let's push a little more, a little more for the night. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Can I push some more? So the first time they could relate with the books of the Bible that there was a harmony to all of it. When that was done, look at Luke chapter 24 verse 46 now. He has opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Then Luke chapter 24 verse number 46. Please pay attention. Glory to God. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer. And to rise from the dead the third day. Now can we say that verse 46 was a summary of what he taught them? Huh? Christ will suffer. Christ will rise. Is that a summary of the whole Bible? Yes. So which means the Christ revelation is the revelation of the Old Testament. The Christ revelation is the revelation of the Old Testament. Which means, until the Old Testament reveals Christ and his truths, you are just reading stories. Until the Old Testament reveals Christ and his truths, you are just reading stories. That is to say, the substance in the Old Testament is Christ and his truths. Of course, I miss many stories. The stories are irrelevant. What is relevant is Christ and his truths. The book is about Jesus Christ. Or the book was written about Christ. Now, when he did that, the Bible says he showed them that he must suffer and rise. 
Look at the next thing he did. This is very key now. Verse 47 of Luke 24. Luke 24 verse 47. And our repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Forgiveness of sin is not a prayer. It's a preaching. As I'm preaching, if you believe you are forgiven, should be preached, not prayed. What should be preached? Repentance. I heard that there's one man of God in Nigeria who said that I am preaching the message of salvation. That the message of salvation is pre-nursery class. That there are other bigger messages. Like the kingdom. When illiteracy wants to disgrace a man in public. It makes him say things where he cannot withdraw them. <laughs> that me, I'm preaching salvation. is pre-nursery class. That there are deeper things. Things like the kingdom. Things like the message of repentance. Repentance is more powerful than salvation. Kingdom. Kingdom. Dimensions and realms. <laughs> it's those jargons that has produced a lot of atheists in the church. High sounding nonsense. The word of God is so simple. He said, beware lest anybody spoil you through the simplicity that is in Christ. So don't let anybody mess you around. What is deeper than Christ? <laughs> what is kingdom? Kingdom. So until you preach kingdom, you are still playing games. The real message is the message of the kingdom. And I know the proponent of that message of the kingdom because he was my friend, my very good friend. I don't call names. He was my good friend. He is the, he is the founder of the kingdom theology. And he used to come to my house. He used to stay with me. He made it popular worldwide. He is the founder of that theology. You must know where things come from before you run with them. When we began to talk about the gospel with him, his main point with me was that he has never read anywhere in the Bible outside Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Finish. That his own Bible is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because that is where you have the direct words of Jesus in red. A man of God that went to proper seminary is talking like this. Then you know that it is not given to those in seminary to understand revelation knowledge. Some of the most confused people are people that went to seminary. They are more confused than the seminary. Shamba calls it cemetery. Kingdom. He said because in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus told them to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they forget that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are parables. Everything Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were all parables. The word parabole. What is a parable? A parable is a mode of communication for people whose IQ is low. Dummies. You use parable for dummies. Jesus used parables because these people were not born again. They couldn't handle spiritual details. So he used early stories to communicate little, little lessons. Preparing them for the future. So a parable is an earthly story from which you communicate a little lesson. So when he says go and preach that the kingdom is at hand. The word at hand doesn't mean hand. It's like goat. The word hand means it has arrived. Arrived is here. What you're saying is go and preach saying that me that they are waiting for has arrived. So Jesus is the kingdom. He couldn't tell them I am the kingdom. They will stone him. 
So he had to tell them that the kingdom has arrived. Then one day they were looking for the kingdom. They were looking for the kingdom. Then Jesus said to them, the kingdom does not come by observation. The kingdom is within it. What you are saying is the kingdom you are looking for. I'm the one. I'm here. I'm inside you guys here. Don't go to the mountain. No. <laughs> no, the kingdom is here. I'm teaching good. But do you realize that after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't talk about the gospel of the kingdom anymore. Because the kingdom had come. What did the kingdom come for? To suffer and to die. And to rise on the third day. That's the destination of the kingdom. So the kingdom message expired at the point of death, burial, and resurrection. Now what do we preach? We preach the message of his resurrection. We preach the message of his resurrection. And what is the total destination of his resurrection? Salvation. You start with salvation, you finish with salvation. Salvation is the totality of the message of the New Testament. It's not kindergarten. That is the real message. That's the good. I'm teaching good. The kingdom has already arrived. So today, when you receive Jesus, you receive the kingdom in a person. Christ in you. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is... Are we teaching here? Now, but I want to focus on repentance. Because in the church world, they will tell you, if you don't repent, God will not forgive you. You must repent before God will forgive you. And they explain repentance as a change of your ways. The things I used to do, I do them. You see how all of you know it? Because you were punished with that song. <laughs> I will never. <laughs> I will never. I am in the which, which kind of stupid Lord's army? <laughs> stupid Lord's army that come on meat, you cannot forgive. <laughs> meat inside pot, Lord's army. <laughs> and it makes children not like God. It makes children see God like a terrorist. I just took one meat and look at the punishment. Are you so poor? So poor, and you say your streets are full of gold? Common meat, you cannot spare a little boy meat. <laughs> I didn't throw it away. I ate it because I was hungry. <laughs> so children grow up with animosity towards God. And then to make matters worse, they now enter a church where they are taught that God kills. That God is one of the members of Sambisa Forest. That God is a commander general of terrorism. If you try him, fear, you're gone. Touch me by mistake, die by correction. Consuming fire. For our God is a consuming fire. I was preaching somewhere and somebody stood up and said, I like the message, but what do you have to say about this scripture that says, our God is a consuming fire? <laughs> then I said to the person, has it consumed you? <laughs> so the person said to me, so what's the meaning of consuming fire? I said to the person, it means that God has consumed all our sins on Jesus. All our sins has been consumed. So the consuming fire was not the kind of fire you are thinking of. It was the judgment of God for sins. And Jesus bore it for us. So for me, there's no more consuming fire. Because the fire has consumed my sins on Jesus. I'm free from consuming fire. Glory to God. You know this message is so sweet. I was preaching this somewhere in Port Harcourt and one elderly woman stood up in the morning and said to me, I like what you are preaching, but let us be careful the way we are saying it. <laughs> so we don't give people license to sin. <laughs> I said, so you are more powerful than Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit did it, was not careful to write it. You should be careful to say it. Many people just can't trust God. They can't trust in God's ability. They think God is a weakling. They think God cannot take care of his own. 
They actually think we are the ones taking care of God. So we must manage him well. And you forget that salvation is of the Lord. You forget that God is able to save to the uttermost. You forget that being the confident of this very thing, that he that has begun the work of salvation, he will be faithful to present. You forget that he is the one that will present you to himself, a church without spot, without wrinkle, without any such thing, but that you should be holy. You forget that he's the one that will present. Ah, you forget that he's the one that keeps, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. No one can pluck you out of my hand. My father that gave you to me is greater than all. And none can pluck you out of my father's hands. It's called eternal life. It's called eternal salvation. It's called everlasting life. What is everlasting? Everlasting is everlasting. Titi lai lai. Titi 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 lai lai lai. Glory. Glory to God. So what is repentance? Let's demystify that quickly. Now, notice, why was Jesus killed? He was killed for our sins. Why was he raised from the dead? He was raised for our sins. So repentance and remission of sins. Or repentance, which is remission of sins. That and is the Kai, K-A-I, the Kai rule of Bible interpretation, which means the and there, repentance and remission is not a connection, it is an explanation. Repentance, which is remission of sins. Did Jesus die for the remission of sins? Yes. Did he die for repentance? Yes. So the word repentance should be what? It's not change your ways. Change your ways is not repentance. Change your dressing is not repentance. The brother has just cut all of his hair because he's now born again. He's truly born again. No, that's not repentance. It's not a change of hairstyle. The word repentance is the Greek word metanoa. Metanoa. M-E-T-A. Meta means to turn around or to shift. To turn around or to shift. That's the word meta. Then there's the word Noah. N-E-O-A is the word we just saw in verse 45. They are thinking. He opened their understanding that they might understand. So they are thinking. The word knows. N-O-U-S. Now, somebody said, why do you always use Greek? Greek, Greek and Hebrew. We use Greek because English language is about 600 years old. English language. Which means in Bible days, in the book of Acts, nobody spoke English. The gospel was preached in Greek because Greek was for the intellectuals of their day. So English was just one of the translations that emerged in the last 1,000 years. Which will mean that the original letters were written in the language used in those days. So many times in translating from one language to another, you translate depending on the verbiage that is available in that language. It's like now if I give you the English Bible to translate your local dialect, there are words in English you cannot find in your dialect. So those words will be missing in your translation. Are we together here? We are translating all my books into French. We are in the process of that translation. And we found out that the French Bible doesn't have the complete verbiage that English has. Many things are missing in the French Bible. So when you read the French Bible, you won't understand what we are understanding. I'm serious. So instead of using the French Bible to translate our books, we are doing direct translation. We just carry the way it is in King James, English, and just put it like that in French. We are not following their own limited vocabulary because then a lot of stuff will be missing. Even with that, even with that, the local French people who preach the Bible will have problem with our books. That's the issue with translation. Because of verbiage limitation, certain flavors get missing. All right? So, when King James interpreted the Greek and Hebrew, a lot of English verbiage was in there.
today we have that verbiage. So what we do now is we go to the Greek. We just take exactly the way it is. In today's understanding, we interpret. That's what I do when I teach. It's not trying to show off. It's just a job. That's my responsibility. Are we teaching here? For example, today when it rains heavy, we say it rains cat and dogs. It rains cat and dogs, like good. It rains cat and dogs. It rains cat and dogs. In another 60 years from now, that may not be in use. If I wrote a book today and I put, while I was going to Lekki to preach, it rained cat and dogs. If that is no more in use in the next 50, 60 years, somebody reading my book then will think cat and dogs were falling from the sky. Except somebody that is here today is there at that time to explain to them that cat and dogs doesn't mean animals falling from the sky. It means heavy rain. That same way it is the way it was. That's why you would read something like, suffer the little children to come unto me. Suffer them. The only way they can come to me is to suffer them. But that's not what it meant. Are we in the building? For example, you read the Bible, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then he says, for God so loved the world. Uh -uh. You say, I shouldn't love the world. You, you are loving the world. What kind of thing is this? Then he says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. Then he now says, go into all the world. How can I go to the world and preach if I'm not their friend? But when you get to the Greek, you find out that there are two words for world. There's a word cosmos and there's a word aeons. Cosmos is a cosmopolitan. Aeon is a way of thinking. So when he says, love not the world, what he's saying is, love not the aeons. Love not their way of thinking. For God so loved the cosmos. He loves men, human beings. Friendship with the aeons. is enmity with God. Go into all the cosmos. Now you will need the Greek in today's understanding to have a clear understanding of what the scriptures are communicating. Am I teaching good? Okay, I'll show you one word in a short while. Let's deal with this word, repentance. Metanoa. <clears throat> Meta, to turn around or to shift. Alright? Now, which means that repentance today was not repentance then. Repentance today was not repentance then because language has evolved. But the understanding of the word in the Greek is metanoia, which means thinking. Thinking. A change of thinking. Repentance is a change of thinking, not a change of lifestyle. Did the disciples just have a change of thinking when Jesus opened the scriptures to them? Yes. Their thinking changed. So what happened to them? They repented. A change of thinking. So that's why you must realize that the repentance is repentance about God. Repentance about God and his world. So repentance or a change of thinking. Jesus said, go and preach a change of thinking. That means people are not thinking right about God. So we preach a change of thinking. Repentance. Not a change of dressing. A change of thinking. Thinking is what? Remission of sins. So in other words, people will see God in a way they have not seen him before now. People will see God in a way they have not seen him before now. Look at something here. That same Luke 24, 47, before I go to Romans. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Please put it up for me. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And that repentance, which is remission of sins, should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, that repentance is not a repentance of your behavior. Is your repentance of the scriptures. 
You must change your mind about the scriptures. The way you saw the scriptures, when the scriptures are now interpreted in the light of Christ, there is a paradigm shift. You change your thinking. Look at something else. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. Somebody getting blessed? Romans chapter 2 verse number 1 to 4. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges does the same things. Next verse. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Next verse. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Next verse. Let's all read together. Everybody want to go. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Question What leads men to repentance? The goodness of God. So if God wants you to repent, what does He pour on you? Goodness. Repentance is change of mind. So somebody says to me, Pastor Funke, very wicked woman. Very, very terrible woman. Blah, 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 blah. So I said to the person, really? He says, yes. I said, okay. I've heard you. Thank you. Then I decide to meet Pastor Funke by myself and experience her. And I discover that she is opposite of everything the person has said. What happens to my mind? It changes. When you taste God's goodness, you change your mind about God. When you taste God, hey, hey, how can somebody who died for me be the one killing me? Then you can now shout, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For the gospel of Christ is what? The power of God unto destination, salvation, not unto destruction. So anywhere there is destruction, God is not there. Anywhere there is sickness, God is not there. Anywhere there is disaster, God is not there. Anywhere you see the power of God, what will you find? Salvation. So you taste God's goodness, it changes the way you think. Suddenly, karma doesn't hold anymore. The law of karma. You think you will escape? You cannot hide it from God. You cannot hide it from God. You may cover all your sins that no one else can see, but you cannot hide it from God. God will catch you. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. God is angry. God is angry. The last time I checked, he was laughing. God is happy all the time. He's never angry. Never. His anger was for three days. God has only been angry for three days. And the anger was on himself. The anger was not for you or against you. It was on himself. I feel like I'm teaching good tonight. In the book of Isaiah, it says, In a little rot, I hid my face. That little was Friday, Saturday. I mean, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Because Jesus didn't die on Friday. He died on Thursday. It's called high mass in Israel. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, breaking Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. Three days, three nights. He said, I hid my face. He said, but with my loving kindness, I will gather you. Three days, separation. And at the end of three days of separation, eternal reunion. Are we teaching good? It's called substitutionary sacrifice. He died, I live. He went to hell, I go to heaven. He was rejected, I am accepted. Are we teaching here? He took my place. I said, I said surely, he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for 
our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. He took my place in death so I can take his place in life. He was joined to death so I am joined to life. He became sin. I am righteous. I did nothing to be righteous. Just by that identification it's not a feeling i don't care how you feel you are righteous there are days you don't feel righteous it changes nothing me too there are days i don't feel like a man but i'm still a man there are days i wake up i don't know whether i'm a man or what i am i just don't know what i am i just know i'm something but it doesn't change the fact that i'm a man yeah i'm a man amen <laughs> glory to god I'm righteous whether I feel it or not. Irrespective of how I feel, I am the righteousness of God. Where? If I'm teaching God, shall glory. Yeah, that's who you are. You're God's righteousness. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repent. Please see that. God does not overlook sin. God does not overlook sin. Sin is serious. God is too holy to behold sin. So what God did was, he gathered sin, gathered sin, gathered sin, and swallowed it. Swallowed sin, and died with it. And in death, destroyed sin. And rose without sin. You know what God did? He looked for sin, looked for sin, trapped it, trapped it, trapped it, trapped it. Went all over humanity, trapped the sins of men. Then God calculated to eternity future, all the sins that will be committed times 10 billion. Then God backdated to eternity past, all the sins that have been committed times a billion, billion times. Then took it on Christ. That is, you can never sin enough to go beyond the death of Christ. Never. There's nothing a man is capable of doing that will be bigger than the death of Christ. I'm teaching good here. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15. Pay attention. Hebrews chapter 9 verse number 15. I feel this thing in this building. Can you feel what I feel? And for this cause, somebody shout for this cause. He is the mediator of what? The New Testament. That by means of what? Death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under what? So, when Jesus was to die, God backdated to Adam. Carried everything Adam has done down to where Jesus was standing. Then God, who sees the end from the beginning, and the beginning from the end, went to the end of time and brought all of man's sin, including your children's 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 sin, and poured it on Jesus. What is the lamb? What is the lamb that was slain? Transgressions of the sins that were under the first testament. By means of death, he died and in dying, he destroyed sin. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith we have iron with god that word peace is union or inseparable union we are intertwined with god like scrambled eggs you can't separate one from the other we are eternally in a union with god i feel like somebody's catching this thing by whom we have access into this grace we are in we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Teaching good tonight? Please sit down. It's his goodness that leads men to repentance. So you know what God is saying? If you will ever know him, you will have to use the binoculars of his goodness. If you are not using the lenses of God's goodness... To look at God, you can never know him. You cannot know God in anger. You cannot know God in destruction. You cannot know God in disaster. You cannot know God in death. If you are still seeing God via killing, you have not known God. You are far from God. The God of the Bible. Maybe your village God, you are close. But the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible wants to be known in his mercy. In his goodness. 
Some said to me, but Dr. Damila, the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Did you read English? He didn't say, shall we continue to, to sin? He said, shall we continue in? And what was the answer? God forbid. God forbid is not English, God forbid. God forbid. <laughs> God forbid. Uh, God forbid in the Bible means impossible. Impossible. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? Know ye not? Don't you know? PJ English, you know no say that as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death. Don't you know that born again means you have died? You died. You died to sin. You died to Satan. You died to anything that the devil offers. You are now alive to God. So sin is strange to your tongue. If you taste it, you push it out. Because your taste board are not designed to, to enjoy it. It's alien to you. You're a new man. Brand new. Without a record of the past. Somebody say repentance. Change of thinking. And that change of thinking comes by preaching. Preaching the rightly divided word of God. As we begin to rightly divide the word of God and the word of truth, your mind begins to change. Some of us, our minds have changed. Some of us, our minds are still changing. There's an ongoing walk. It's not going to change in one day. Because CRK messed you big time with my book of Bible stories. In that your family uh, parlor where you people used to gather for breakfast. Yellow book like that. Morning devotion. Those books, all of them messed you up because that book came from Jehovah's Witness. And their theology is work. And almost every home in Africa had that book. All of us are victims. But we're free now. We know God in his mercy. Say, I know God in his mercy. Let me shock you. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 10. Mm -mm. I have many things to say to you and you will bear it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, say of the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. Now watch the next thing. Next verse. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Nobody needs to teach you. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why will they know God? Now remember, he said in the Old Testament they didn't know him. But now in the New Testament they shall know him. Why? For I will be merciful. They shall know me because I will be revealed to them in my true character, which is mercy. Watch. I put it up. I will be merciful to their... He didn't say they will not have unrighteousness. He said they will have unrighteousness. But my response to their unrighteousness will be mercy. They shall know me in my mercy. And their sins, so they will have sins. And iniquities, so they will have iniquities. But I will not hold them accountable. I will not hold them accountable. For David said, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. That was David. But today your iniquities are not covered. They don't exist. Taken away. Deleted. Wiped out. God wants you to know him in his mercy. And when you know God in his mercy, you pray anytime and you know his answer. When you know God in his mercy, you're not afraid. You're confident. You're bold. When you know God in his mercy, you talk to him all the time and you know he's hearing you. You don't have to meet some qualifications. You don't have to pray at 12 midnight every day. You shake a little bottle of oil and dab yourself like a ritualist. No bottle is stronger than Jesus and he lives in you. Why will you be anointing yourself and Jesus? Are you thinking forward or backward? <laughs> and they will bring the bottle to a man of God to pray in Jesus' name. And the man of God will pray on the bottle in Jesus' name. And they will take the bottle and anoint themselves and Jesus. Two steps forward, 30 steps backward. 
But I have news for you. That anointing lives in you. You don't need a jar of oil. You are the jar of oil. Glory to God. Say with me, I am in him. He is in me. Say, in my mind, repentance is going on. Because God's character is being revealed in the scriptures. I didn't hear a powerful amen. They shall know me from the greatest to the least of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and their sins and their transgressions. I will remember again no more. Now, I'm about to round off. Then we kick off from here tomorrow. They did not know the kindness of God leads to repentance. They didn't know that. What is repentance again? A change of thinking. So in their knowledge, they had wrong facts about God. Wrong facts. Not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. It leads to a change of thinking. Not thinking about yourself, but thinking about God. So which means the repentance is about God. To change how you view God. To change how you see God. In other words, a lot of people have distorted views about God. Distorted views. The first thing God asks Adam is, where are you? Adam says, I'm, I was afraid of you. Distorted view. I was afraid of you. I'm naked. What did God say? Who told you? Who have you been talking to? You've been listening to the wrong pastor. The wrong preacher is preaching in your room. Now your TV channel is always on the wrong preacher. That radio station is always talking to you the wrong things. Who told you you're naked? And he, and he mentioned the source. The woman you gave me. Madam, how far? The serpent. Serpent has nobody to blame. So there's no point asking him. When you listen to the wrong teaching, you will have a distorted view of God. The quality of your Christian life cannot be greater than the preacher you listen to. Never. The quality of your Christian life can never be greater than the preacher you listen to. And let me quickly mention, it's not how many preachers you listen to that determines spiritual growth. In fact, listening to more preachers than one can, can, can stunt your growth. God didn't say, I'll give you he didn't say I will give he didn't say I will give you pastors to pastor you. Say my sheep hear my voice, not my voices. My voice, a singular voice. A singular voice. So that when you grow progressively, you mature in the knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. They shall know me. Say I know God. Say it again, I know God in Christ Jesus. Say it again, I know God in Christ Jesus. For the last time, say it again. I know God in Christ Jesus. Now say with me very loud, God is my father. I know my father. How many of you know you can never trust a man beyond your knowledge of his character? It's the character of a man that makes you trust him or distrust him. So this weekend, tomorrow, Sunday, we're going to be exploring God's character. We're going to go deep into God's character because the deeper you know his character, the more you can relax and rely on him. Hallelujah. They will know me in my mercy. They will know me in my grace. Hallelujah. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Lift your right hand and say, in the name of Jesus, I declare right now, I am a recipient of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's love. And I declare, by regeneration, I am righteous, as righteous as Jesus, right now. Say it again very loud, I am as righteous as Jesus right now said for the last time i am as righteous as jesus right now i didn't hear a powerful amen stand with me tonight father i pray for everybody under the sound of my voice tonight revelation knowledge grows big in our hearts until nothing else matters barriers terminated obstacles broken holes of the enemy totally eradicated in the name of jesus I decree that the word of your grace, the revelation of Jesus grows big in our hearts. 
this weekend as we feast in the world our eyes of understanding illuminated light shines in the dark places of our minds sick bodies be healed be healed be healed and satan i serve you a notice and your kingdom you are subdued and rendered useless in the name of jesus where you need a miracle receive a miracle receive a miracle in the name of jesus father we give you praise and glory and honor for answered prayer in jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of finality can i see you celebrate the word of god for 30 seconds make some noise glory amen it's like we have to teach you how to celebrate in lagos it's like we have to bring it's like we have to import some people here glory! go ahead and celebrate celebrate Man, are you blessed tonight? I'm going to answer a few questions, but before I answer questions, I want to take up your offerings. Every time we hear God's word, we respond to God's word with joy. We give generously. We give liberally. We give with delight. We give with excitement. We don't give to get. We give because God has given us everything that we will ever need. So we give as worship. We give as honor. We give to adore Jesus. For what he has done and we give in honor of god's word there's nothing we have that god didn't give us is of his fullness that we all have received his grace praise god all right lift up your offerings we want to give and if you want to you want to do bank transfers the details are on the screen you have cash whatever you want to do but we give tonight with joy lift up your offerings everybody father we rejoice that tonight we have this opportunity to worship, to honor Christ, and to honor your word. And we give from hearts that are totally saturated with gratitude. And we thank you that our offerings are a sweet smell before you today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. The baskets are in front. You just walk up there and just drop your offerings with joy. Hit it. Let's do it as we worship tonight. Praise God.
you can be seated with your sweet, smart self tonight. Glory to God. All right, I want to answer a few questions because we like to make sure you have clarity of the things we teach so you're fully, fully persuaded to be able to defend the message and preach the message to others and be a blessing to the nations of the earth. Praise God. Any questions tonight? Any questions from what we taught tonight or from anything you've had me teach that wasn't clear? We like to bring clarity. That's the essence of teaching God's word. Anybody? Questions? Anybody? Anybody? Cool. Or if it is written, you can send us. You need a paper to write? Yeah, we can give you a paper if you don't want to come forward. You want to write it and just send it. But we just want to make sure everybody has clarity. Praise God. Anybody? Okay, there's a hand. There's another hand. Okay, you want a paper or you want to come forward? You want to come forward? Sure. All right. All right. Those with questions, please come forward. Just stand this way of the building and Pastor Gospel will help me get the questions and we bring clarity. Praise God. Are you excited? You guys are just looking like this. Are you excited tonight? Praise God. All right, let's do it, Pastor Gospel. Praise God. Hallelujah. And actually, today I was not happy. You were not happy today? I was not happy because I've been taught about God, but I'll be taught about God, but I have not have that experience. But I know I have the Holy Spirit, but I'm confused because some things we do in the church seems idolatry. Things um, like, okay, go ahead. Like explanation because I do smoke. Okay, you do smoke. Yeah. Okay. Because of situation. Okay. So I know I know God. Mm -hmm. like how, how do you go forward in life? How do you go forward yeah. in life? Yeah. Okay. I can tell that you are new. So the first thing we want to do for you is what we call discipleship. We want to take you through fundamental teachings so we can disciple you. In the process of discipleship, you will understand what you are asking me. It's not what I can answer in five minutes. It's what requires proper teaching and explanation. Do you understand? I would like to do that for you. We're very happy to do that. So what I will do for you tonight is I'm so glad you came. We love you. We're glad you're here. Can we clap for him? Okay. Praise God. What we'll do for you is I will hand you over, Pastor Funke, who do we hand him over to for discipleship? Sister Kemi, yes. That sister there is waiting for you. Just walk up to her right now. She will engage with you and plan to take you through discipleship. The next time you see me, you'll be more than happy. All your worries will have been taken care of. God loves you. God bless you. Let me give you a hug. Bless you. She's waiting for you. Just go to her. Next question. Sir, I was invited here. And I want to ask that you said about the dressing that repentance means the change of mind. Change of thinking. Change of, change of thinking. Yes. So what if like can we say people that wear skinny clothes? If they are can they still continue wearing it? Or like people that like did dread and just say you said change of mind and they were like they accepted Jesus and can it still be? In that dress Can okay, so dressing does not affect God. That's why sometimes you are naked and you pray and God answers. Because whether you dress or not, it doesn't affect God. So why do we dress? We dress to cover our nakedness, number one. Number two, we dress so we can fit into our society. So dressing is cultural. Okay? So if in your culture, bread locks are accepted, you can put them on. If in your culture, to paint your hair red, green, purple, yellow is accepted, it's dressing. That's the acceptable culture where you are.
But even the culture where you belong to, they don't do such things. You don't want to look odd. Okay, you don't want to look strange. So that you don't answer too many questions. So you dress in the acceptable manner within your culture and your society. But dressing doesn't affect God. Whether you wear knicker, trouser, if you like, remove your hair. If you like, as a man, wear attachment, paint one side green, one side yellow. If you like jelly coil, God is not affected. But it's because of people you dress. So dress in a way that is accepted within your society. Is that clear? God bless you. You have another one. I'd like to answer another one. Okay. Sir, what you said, Christ is in us. Yes. So what if you have in one, like, an admission, and you are trying to, you are praying for it, praying for it, and it does not work? Is well, it that Christ is not in Christ you? does not want to answer you that period, or he does not want you to gain admission that period, when your mates are, like, in higher level than you are? But do you know that there are people who don't care about Christ and they have admission? They even have three, four, five. So you don't come to Christ for admission. You as need it. Okay. Can you say as an example? Okay. What if like another situation? Okay, and you pray and God doesn't answer. It does not come with immediate effect and you need it. Like sharp, sharp. Like microwave. You are asking for healing for like any of a family member. Yes. And like the doctor said in several days time. And three, day four, five, nothing changed. Is that sometimes, sometimes. See, God answers you always. The moment you pray, God answers. But God's answers are communicated through people. Okay? So God can answer you, but the person he wants to use. To bring the answer to you may not be ready. And God doesn't force people. Okay? So God will have to begin to woo the person. Woo the persons. And walk through circumstances. Until everything falls in place. Do you understand? And because God doesn't force people. He's not a wicked person. He has to make people willing. That's why sometimes there's a delay. In the answers. Is it clear? God bless you. Let's clap for her. Papa. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you as my daddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you are doing in my life. Thank you. My question is I want to have more clarity. Okay. In this sin that Christ died for. Okay. You know, character uh -huh. and dimension. Uh -huh. So I need to know the difference for, for, for my disciples. Yes. You understand? Yes. Because when I talk to them, you are not a sinner. They will say, God forbid, I'm a sinner. Yes. So I need more. Expansion. So don't tell them you are not a sinner. Tell them you are a sinner. But Christ died for your sin. And today, you can receive the benefit of that death and be free from sin. Do you understand? Because they are still sinners. The fact that Christ died doesn't mean they are no more sinners. It is only when they receive the offer of Christ's death that their sins are done away so don't tell them you're not a sinner because they know they are but tell them about god's offer and how that if they receive the offer their sins are forgiven okay now i know what you're trying to deal with here is what they call the original sin and sins the original sin is unbelief unbelief a rejection of the gospel it is from unbelief that character flaws degenerated from unbelief. So unbelief is the mother of sin. Do you understand? So once a man receives the gospel, that unbelief goes. Christ comes in. As he begins to learn Christ, 
the learning of Christ begins to affect his character. Is it clear? God bless you. Second question. Second question is uh, forgiveness of sin. Okay. You know, when you tell somebody, you don't have to confess your sin, but you confess Christ. They will quote Second Corinthians chapter 5. Can, can that be a, a put it on the screen second corinthians chapter 5 verse what as now enjoy the liberty stand fast in the liberty yes, where christ fast. has set you free yes and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage yes okay so now, was that uh, that statement now is yes. it for for believers or non-believer is for believers a non-believer does not have liberty he's still in bondage is the believer that has liberty to stand in so this scripture is for believers that have been made free the unbeliever has been made free by christ but he has not accepted it so he's still in bondage that's why we preach so he can accept the liberty and be free is it clear god bless you thank you Good evening, Doctor. Good I, evening. Um, I'm so honored to be here because I've been following your series up to like two or three to four years now. But, wow. Well, I don't have the opportunity of standing. I'm and, blessed to see you too. Yes. And my question has to do with um, the change of thinking. Change of thinking. Yeah. Because how do I now, as an evangelist, like what you rightly said, that, okay, you are a sinner. Is not the fornication, is not the adultery, is not this other list that is the real sin. It's you changing your mind towards. So I really want to have um, more explanation on that so that I won't, there, won't, there won't be a kind of question thrown at me and I won't know what to say. Or because probably I can also quote scriptures. But I really want to be very sure to have more idea because I really saw myself this night. So I'm honored. That's why I said, let me ask that question again. The area of um, the, the change of thinking, you know, when it comes to repentance, yeah. not you having it in mind, you, you fornicate. You know more you, fornicate uh -huh. and all that. So as an evangelist, your message is not sin. Your message is Christ. You preach Christ, what he has done, the price he has paid. When people believe, they are saved. Now, after they are saved, they have to be taught it is the teaching of God's word that corrects their mind. It is called the renewing of the mind. Their mind does not change automatic. They have to be taught. So that is why when you get people born again, you plant them in a church where they are taught. That's why even you as an evangelist ought to do the work of a pastor. So after you evangelize, they accept the gospel. You bring them in, sit them down, and begin to teach them what happened when they received that gospel. That's a full walk. You preach, they get saved, they come in, you start teaching. That teaching is the process of changing the mind towards God. No, don't remind them where they're coming from because it has no power to change them. Remind them where they're going to. We don't look at behind, we look at the front, and the front is what Christ has done. It is we all with open face beholding the glory of God as in a mirror, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God will only initiate the change when the mirror you're looking at is the right mirror. You know there are different mirrors. You must see the right mirror. God bless you. Yes. Good evening, Papa. Good evening. I need clarification about prayer. Okay. Can a believer not pray? Like you mentioned something that it's not much that you wake up in the night to pray every day. So I feel like I'm very lazy when it comes to prayer. So can I be a believer and still not pray? If you're a Is believer and you don't pray, Satan will just be using it to play football. Oh, okay. Because prayer generates power. Prayer takes the power of God inside and makes it available for you to live in daily victory. Prayer changes you. As you pray and spend time in prayer, 
it begins to change your lifestyle prayer solidifies your fellowship with god so as a christian if you're not praying you're playing satan will just be doing you like this life will just be doing you like this the authority that is yours in christ you will not see it manifest so prayer is critical jesus when he was on earth prayed all the time what was he looking for nothing he was just making power available because of his mission on earth if you believe that you have a mission on earth then you must pray because prayer will help you fulfill that mission that you have so prayer is important it's not just for asking things it's for building you up but ye beloved building up your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost you know what i will encourage you to get my teaching on prayer just get it just begin to listen you don't have to try to pray as you begin to listen you will see yourself praying that prayer you will pray it you will pray it till you will pray it you will pray it <laughs> you won't be lazy again okay god bless you amen yeah. so um, this is my question okay you said christ has come christ has died and he resurrected and as he resurrected he all our sins are gone so what's explain to me the um, judgment day in revelation what's the point judgment day is for people who reject that death that christ died the death of christ is an offer to mankind when you receive what his death has provided you are saved when you reject what his death has provided you are damned so in that damnation is the judgment and the judgment is separation from God forever is it clear the death of Christ is for all human beings but it's an offer if I make you an offer you have a right to receive and a right to reject if you reject my offer will I force you I won't Christ died for everybody but it's an offer if you receive it is activated in you if you reject you are without it now when you reject the gospel there's nothing god can do for you that's why judgment day is it clear john 3 16 17 and 18. for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but he has to believe but have everlasting life he that believeth not is condemned already are you following because he has not believed in the only begotten son of god so if you reject the gospel there's nothing christ can do for you that's where the judgment comes so what about people that doesn't have the opportunity to hear about god and then what happens to them there's nobody like that people hear about god every day and everywhere that question you're asking is, is assumption we don't assume like the thief on the cross the people in the city will have thought he died without without the gospel but they didn't know that on the cross just at the dying moment he had the gospel he believed the gospel and he went to paradise so you can't assume you're not there when people are dying you don't know what happens to them those few seconds before they go god loves people and has made provision for everybody to hear the gospel is it clear God bless you but i will encourage you to also be discipled because you still have a lot of things you are not sure about and we would like to help you it's not a laughing matter it's a serious matter we'd like to help you so my encouragement will be we'd like to disciple you is pastor kemi around okay pastor rose is there she's your friend from this night she will help fix your issues praise god next question Praise God. Hallelujah. So my question is uh, what you said about the, the love of the world and the love for God. Yes. So you made mention of if any man love the world, is an enmity to God. Yes. And if you, you cannot love God and love the world. Yes. And you explained it that loving the world is not hating your neighbor. Yes. Is hating on the thinking, the yes. mentality of how the world thinks. Clap for him. Good preacher. So, 
So yes. what I'm saying now is the the question the little girl asks yes. about the dressing. Yes. How we dress, how we look. Yes. Now we have this thought in us. Yes. When we see someone we can say this one is the is a child of the world. Yes. Is a child of the devil. Yes. Because of how he dress, yes. how he speaks yes. and what he does. Yes. Now if we are to like say the love of the world are stay from the love of the world. Yes. Then what are we talking about? Like there are so many things that entice us. All in the world. that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So to love the world is to lust after the spirit of this world. It's a spirit that works in the children of disobedience. It's not dressing. Do you understand? It's not dressing. The spirit of this world is a spirit that fights against God and his word. It's called the spirit of disobedience to the gospel. That's the spirit of this world. Not your dressing. There's a place called Puerto Rico. When you go to Puerto Rico in their culture, men wear cap to church. It's cultural. So if I go there to preach, I will wear a cap to preach. Dressing is cultural. It does not affect salvation. Do you understand? Because God is not... Okay, do you know what kind of cloth Jesus was wearing? Woman gown. You woman gown. That they tie the waist with a band. With sandal. That's what all of them were wearing. But culture has changed. Today we're wearing trousers. Do you understand? So dressing has not... It's, the, it's religion that has messed us up with dressing. Dressing does not score a point with God. Dressing is for us human beings. Like this, your gym, when they tear the knee. Eh? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's fashion. There's nothing wrong with it. Is that good? I like the way you're smiling. Do you understand? So, dressing is not what defines worldliness. It's the spirit of the world. I, I understand you, sir. But, like the way I'm dressed, like normally. You're cool, man. Uh, me, I don't dress like this in church. Yeah, but today you dress and come. <laughs> I feel like... Why are you tempting God? <laughs> <laughs> like, when I dress like this... Uh, I, I see myself like not dressing well. Why, why? What's wrong with it? Because normal. Waiting. Uh, <laughs> Maybe fashion. So, uh, so what I'm, my question now is, I, I like the way you answer me, but I'm still confused in this. The, the way we dress is nothing to do with our Christian life. But how do you single out Christians among multitudes? Like if you will use dressing to singular Christians, you will be deceived by Muslims. The women cover everything, you don't even see anything. That's holiness, eh? So we don't use people's dressing to single them out. How do we know Christians? We know Christians by the fruit of the word of God in their lives. Do you understand? For example, love, joy. Peace, gentleness, long-suffering, patience, meekness, all of those things is what reveals a Christian. That's the fruit of the Spirit. You also need foundation class. So I'm recommending you for foundation class right now. Where is Pastor Rose? We start the, his class. Sharp, sharp, sharp. Sharp. No delay. Sharp, sharp, sharp. And I need a report on their foundation, on their discipleship class. Yes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Mine is not a question. It's a clarification. Okay. Okay. Um, today you talk about um, the voice people heard. Talk about translation and understanding. But in the book of Mark, chapter 23 to 25, you know, 23 said, book of Mark, chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 23 said, said, but on 24, he said, pray. But on 25, he said, forgive before you pray. So before you pray, forgive. But my question is, why did you put before you pray, forgive in the 25th 
page. Me, for my understanding, uh, because it's not the same. Yes. You should have put it before, but I don't know that, that it makes me confused. Uh, so now you don't follow that order. Seek to understand what the whole context is communicating. So what is the whole context communicating? Is communicating forgiveness. It's not even communicating prayer. His communication there chiefly is forgiveness. That the way God has forgiven you, you also forgive people. Case closed. Is it clear? That's the whole context. His forgiveness he was teaching. He first of all used the fig tree. He spoke to the tree. It dried up. He told them, have faith in God. That's how you can make things happen. Then he now told them, when you pray, okay, believe, you shall have what you say. When you stand praying, forgive. Because unforgiveness denies you the ability to receive the answers that God has given. It's not that unforgiveness will stop God from answering you. Nothing stops God. But unforgiveness will weaken your hand from collecting your answer. So in order for your hand not to be weak in collecting your answer, release unforgiveness so you can have strength to take what God has already given. Is it clear? God bless you. Praise God. Yep, yep. So can we have some questions? One or two before we go. Okay, we have six. Six? Yes. Okay, let's see how fast we can go. Right. Sharp, sharp, sharp. First one. If the law of Moses brings forth more condemnation, what is the purpose of the law and is it divine well the purpose of the law was simple moses gave them christ they rejected christ then they now say that they themselves by themselves can qualify for god so moses gave them a standard that they cannot keep so some of them now pride themselves in keeping it then jesus showed up and said you have heard it was said that if you sleep with a woman you commit adultery but i say you don't have to sleep. If you just look at a woman like this and you do her eye like this, you have committed adultery. All of them say, who can be saved? That's the point. The point of the law is to defeat man, to show man that there's nothing you can do that is good, so you can look up to what Jesus has done. Is it clear? Next. Sir, in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, I didn't get the word past. Does it mean death was transferred to all men? It was passive. And the death there is not extinction. That there is separation from God. So people were separated from God by their choice. Whether to believe the gospel or reject the gospel. That's what determined whether they were separated or they were left united with God. So that word death is not extinction. It's separation. And it was passing from one person to another. From one person to another. And it, it keeps going like that all over the world. Is it clear? Yeah. Third one. Good evening, Papa. I am a Muslim. I am not sure the difference between Muslims and Christians or the religion. I should follow. Sir, please. I need clarity. Sir, please. Who is Jesus? Who is Allah? And what is the message of Christianity? I am quite confused on this matter. Uh, well, you will be confused, but you will get clarity now. Jesus is God Almighty who became a man to save man from sin. So in Christianity, our God is Jesus who became a man. In Christianity, we don't worship Allah. Allah is a stone in Saudi. It's a stone, that black stone is Allah. We don't worship Allah. We worship Jesus Christ. God who became a man. In other religions, they are trying to go to God. In Christianity, we don't try because we can't go. So our God has come to us. See? Because God loves us. He came to us and revealed himself to us. He saw our predicament, stepped into our shoes, took what we could not carry, died, paid the price, freed us, and gave us his life. That's what Christianity preaches. And I would, I would like to help you, whoever wrote that, would like to help you spend some time with you, teach you the word, 
show you who Jesus is in fullness. Answer your questions and pray for you. So if you're the one who asks the question, I'd like you to wait immediately. We close. We'll like to just spend two, three minutes with you before you go. Let's clap for the person. When you said it was judgment day, do you mean that if you do so much bad stuff that God will forgive you immediately? Well, so much bad stuff is not what God forgives. God forgives everything. And he has already forgiven all of man's sins. But man has to receive it. You have to receive that forgiveness through the preaching of the gospel. If you reject it, the moment you reject the gospel, you are judged. He that believeth not is condemned already. So the moment you reject the gospel, you are judged. The moment you accept the gospel, you have escaped judgment. It's, it's as easy as that. So the dividing line is the gospel. Either you accept it or reject it. Are we clear? Papa Tumo, blessings Papa, what is your take on altar call? When we say, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, dot, 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 dot. That's what she wants to know. Then number two, any teaching on the parable of the ten virgins, please, sir? Well, it's not what is my take. It is what, what was the Bible take on altar calls. Altar calls is not a Bible doctrine. There's no Bible teaching for altar call. Evangelists who do crusades devise altar call as a strategy to bring people out of the crowd who have accepted Christ for follow-up. It's not a Bible doctrine. It's evangelists that devise that strategy of separating people that have believed the gospel so they can be followed up. So they now ask them to come to the altar. But most people get born again while sitting down. Because salvation happens the moment Christ is revealed to you and you believe you are saved. But altar call brings you out so we can follow you up and establish you in the knowledge of Christ. Is it clear? Yeah. Last one, Papa. Papa, please, can you explain First John chapter 1 verse 9 that people love confessing their sins and not Christ because this affect a lot of men of god well again you have to understand who was john writing to he was writing to christians and agnostics the agnostics were people who came to church and pretended to be believers and were acting like christians but they were not born again so when john was writing he wrote to believers wrote to agnostics that's why that later is addressing two classes of people look at it for example verse 7 put it up for me first john chapter 1 verse 7 verse 7 brother but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanseth us from all sin so if we are walking in the light of his word there is an automatic cleaning that is taking place in our lives then you now get to verse 8 he's talking to another class if we say we have no sin he's not talking to the people he spoke to in verse 7 this is another group of people if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us next verse if we confess our sins he's not talking to the man that is walking in the light this is another group so two groups of people the agnostics and christians now but there's a there's there's a syntax problem in verse 9 that's why people don't get it in the original there are no commas no full stop no chapter no verses no punctuation it's just sure it's translators that put comma full stop chapter verses that's why some chapters finish in the following chapter see because the translators were the ones who did that job so even that comma there is bible translation that comma is not supposed to be there if you remove that comma now this scripture will come alive so remove it if we confess our sins he so our sin is a he if we confess our sins he how do we know that he is our sin second corinthians 5 21 
God made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. So Jesus is our sin. Our sin bearer. So if we confess our sin bearer, Christ, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That scripture is the same with Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10. If we confess the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So 1 John 1, 9 is salvation. It's not daily confessing of sins. That's why if you come to chapter 2, verse 1, he now leaves the agnostics and comes back to the believer. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, he didn't say confess. He said we have an advocate we have the advocacy of jesus we don't confess he takes care of our sins but if you are not born again confess your sin bearer you'll be saved but if you're saved and you sin remember the advocacy of jesus has taken care of your sins i didn't hear a powerful amen are we blessed tonight Please, can you stand on your feet, turn to two or three people, tell them, don't miss tomorrow morning, 9.30 a.m. Ten thirty. I mean, 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. Come with your friends, come with your loved ones. So good to see Pastor Ladi, Cross Point Church here in Lagos. Celebrate him, celebrate him tonight. Bless you, man. Good to have you here tonight. Praise God. 9.30 tomorrow, we continue teaching. Are you blessed? Why are you looking at me like that? Are you blessed? Glory. Amen. 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. The second question was 10 virgins. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Are you the foolish one? Or are you the wise one? <laughs> what Jesus was actually teaching is a parable. What Jesus was saying is, I have come. The wise ones among you know I have come. The foolish ones don't know I have come. Case closed. It was a parable of Christ. The foolish ones didn't know he was Christ. The wise ones knew he was Christ. It's not a future parable. It's a past parable about Christ among them. Nothing else. That's all in that parable. I have a book. Um, I've forgotten the title of that book now. Living the good life. Living the good life. If you get it, I dealt with all Jesus' parables in that book. It will help you living the good life. Amen. Blessed. Blessed. Give the Lord a praise as I hand over to Pastor Funke tonight. She takes over the microphone. Celebrate her. Glory. Praise God. Thank you, Papa. God bless you. Thank God for the gift of you. I want us to begin.